Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to talk about real numbers. So since this is our first section in the very first video of the course, every single section will start off with a list of statements about what the video will cover. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to locate and label points on a real number line and what the real number line really is, simplify expressions containing the absolute value, identify the opposite of a number, and then translate between phrases between English and expressions written in symbols. So let's start off with what's called the real number line. Any number that you can think of is called a real number. Decimals, fractions, whole numbers, mixed numbers, they are all real numbers. So what we're going to do is how do you actually locate a real number on a number line? So any number you can think of can be represented on a real number line. This number line is constructed with a convenient location called zero, which is the origin. So zero is the origin on this number line. It separates the positive real numbers from the negative real numbers. If you're on the right side of the origin, those are called positive real numbers because that's the positive direction. And if you're on the left side of the origin, those are called negative real numbers because that's the negative direction. So let's start with example one. We're going to locate real numbers on a real number line. Locate and label the points on a real number line that associates with these points or these numbers. Negative 3.5, negative 1 and 1 fourth, or negative 5 fourths if you want to change that to improper fraction. 1 half, 3 quarters or 3 fourths, and then 2.5. Each one of these numbers has a location on the real number line. So we can draw a real number line. I'm just going to go between negative 4 and 4 because all these numbers will fit between negative 4 and positive 4. Negative 3.5, that is halfway between negative 3 and negative 4. So start at the origin, find negative 3, negative 4, and negative 3.5 is halfway between those two. So it has its own unique location on the number line and it's labeled as negative 3.5. Negative 1 and 1 fourth. Again, this is a negative number, so it would be on the left side of the origin. So it's a little bit more than negative 1. So negative 1, and then a little bit more than that. It's more negative than negative 1. So negative 1 and a quarter. So it's between negative 1 and negative 2. A quarter of the way past negative 1. Positive 1 half. So it's not a really large positive number, but it is positive. So it's going to be on the right side of the origin, halfway between 0 and 1. So its location would be here on the number line. 3 quarters, again, between 0 and 1. So it's on the right side of 0 because it's positive 3 fourths. So it would be 3 quarters of the way between 0 and 1. And then 2.5 is halfway between 2 and 3. And it's positive, so between positive 2 and positive 3 is 2.5. So this is called the real number line. So it helps sometimes to write fractions as decimals to understand where they're at on the number line. So negative 1 and 1 fourth was negative 5 fourths when you change it to in, an improper fraction. Or as a decimal would be negative 1.25. So anything on the left side of 0 we said was a negative real number. So we had two numbers on the left side of the origin and then we had three on the right side of the origin and those were positive real numbers. And again, it helps to write three quarters or three fourths as a decimal to understand exactly where would it be located on the number line. It's 0 0.75 as a decimal. And we all know that one half is 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So the location on the number line, they have a name, it's called the coordinate. So the number associated with a point on the number line is called the coordinate of that point. So the coordinate of this point on the number line would be negative 1.25 or negative 1 and 1 fourth or negative 5 fourths. It doesn't matter how you label the number line, just this point is corresponding to this number. And as I said, real numbers are any number you can think of because it will be on the real number line in one unique location. So what do real numbers really consist of? Well, they can be whole numbers, as I've said. They can be fractions. They could be decimals. They could be negative numbers. And any other real number you can think of. These will all have locations on the real number line. 
So they can be decimals that have a finite number of decimal places, like 3.52, or like pi, which would have an, an infinite number of decimal places, 3.14159, and so on. Now let's talk about equivalent fractions on a number line. You can use a number line to actually visualize equivalent fractions. So let's think of the fraction A divided by B. A is called the numerator, and B is the denominator. As long as A divided by B is a proper fraction, and that it means proper fraction is A is a smaller number than B, so the smaller number is in the numerator, it's called a proper fraction, you can think of this as if you take a number line where you divide 0 to 1 up into B different parts, then you can visualize where this A divided by B would be located between 0 and 1. Then what would happen is the numerator A tells you how many of the parts that you have between 0 and 1. So let's try this out. Let's say you want to figure out where would 1 third be located on the real number line between 0 and 1 and how to visualize what 1 third really means. So you take the number line between 0 and 1 you divide the number line up into three different parts because the denominator is three, so equal parts as well. So zero to one, one part, two parts, and then the full three parts. Each of these subintervals have a length of one third. So divide the number line up into three equal parts. and that the tick marks, one, this tick mark and this tick mark, are equally spaced between 0 and 1. That means if you go 1 third of the distance between 0 and 1, you're at 1 third. If you go another 1 third of the distance, then you're at 2 thirds on the number line. And if you go another one-third distance, you're at 3 divided by 3, which is also 1. So this means that this smaller distance would be a tick mark located at one-third on the number line. And if you go two tick marks, that would be two-thirds located on the number line. And then three-thirds or 1. Well, you can do the same idea with any denominator. So let's think of this in terms of equivalent fractions. So instead of labeling the number line between 0 and 1 and breaking it up into three equal parts. This time let's break it up into six equal parts. So if you break it up into six equal parts, if the denominator is six, each of them will have a length of one sixth. So you would have one sixth, two sixth, three sixth, four sixth, and so on, all the way up to six divided by six, which is equal to one. Well, think about this in terms of the number line. Each real number has a unique location on the number line. So if one-third is located here on the number line and two-sixths is located in the exact same place on the number line, that means that one-third and two-sixths must be equivalent to one another. So one-third and two-sixths are equivalent. And if we divide the number line up into 12 equal pieces, or 12 equal parts, we will see that the same location as one-third, two-sixths is also four-twelfths. So all three of these are called equivalent fractions. All three fractions have the same coordinates on the number line. So if they have the same coordinate, they must be the same real number. So same idea. You can have two-thirds on the number line was located here. Well, if you go one-sixth more from two-sixth, you're at three-sixth. And if you go another one-sixth, you're at four-sixth. That's the same location as two-thirds. Same thing for, for four-twelfths. If you go one-twelfth more, you're at five-twelfths. You go another one-twelfth, you're at six-twelfths. Another one-twelfth, seven-twelfths, and it looks like eight-twelfths. It's the same location as four-sixths and two-thirds. So two-thirds four sixths and eight twelfths all have the same location on the number line, so those must be equivalent fractions as well. So all three fractions
have the same coordinate. on the number line. Okay, so if they're in the same location on the number line, they must be equal to one another. So if you're looking at 3 sixths and 6 twelfths, what location would that be on the number line? Well, 3 sixths is also the same thing as 1 half. So 3 sixths, 6 twelfths, and 1 half look like they're the same location on the number line. So they must be equal as well. So let's move on to absolute value next. Absolute value just means distance from the origin. So if you see absolute value symbols, it just means what is the distance from the origin is that number. So the definition of absolute value. The absolute value of a real number is the distance from zero on a number line. So if x is a number, a real number, the absolute value of x is represented with vertical bars around the real number. Okay, so let's try example two. We're going to look at absolute value and think of it as distance on a number line from the origin. So evaluate each expression involving absolute value. So negative 6.2. How many units on the number line would negative 6.2 be from the origin? Well, it's negative, so it would be on the left side of the origin, 6.2 units away on the left side. So it's 6.2 units from the origin. The absolute value of 8.5, so again, this is a positive number this time, so it would be on the right side of the origin, but it would be 8.5 units from the origin. So 8.5. Number three, the absolute value of negative two-thirds. So this is on the left side of the origin because it's negative two-thirds. It's a distance of two-thirds from the origin. So now number four, Notice that there's a negative on the outside of the absolute value and there's a negative on the inside of the absolute value. They do not cancel out. You have to think about this in terms of absolute value first and then we'll talk about the negative on the outside second. So what is the distance that negative seven is from the origin? Well, absolute value will always give you a positive answer. So the absolute value of negative seven is seven. But that negative on the outside has to stay. So negative 7. So the absolute value of negative 7 is 7, but that negative on the outside just stays. Absolute value represents the distance each number is from 0. on a number line. So one thing that we've noticed is that if you take the absolute value of a negative number, the answer is positive. If you take the absolute value of a positive number, the answer is positive. That's because the absolute value represents distance. Distance will never be less than zero. The distance either is either zero or a positive number. The only reason why number four came out to be a negative answer is because that negative on the outside the absolute value had to stay in the answer. Okay, so let's try example three now. So example three is going to have sums and differences inside the absolute value. So we have to simplify what's on the inside of the absolute value before we actually can talk about distance from the origin. So number one, evaluate each expression involving the absolute value. So absolute value of two subtract seven. So this is absolute value. 2 subtract 7 is negative 5, so absolute value of negative 5, that's the distance from the origin, or 0, is negative 5. On the number line, it's a units, it's a distance of 5 units from the origin. Okay, number 2. This time we have the absolute value of 10 subtract 4. Get this answer, then subtract the answer from absolute value of 11 subtract 9. So let's do this in two different parts. You have 10 subtract 4, that is 6, so absolute value of 6. Subtract absolute value 11 subtract 9, that's absolute value of 2. So now the absolute value of 6, 6 is 6 units from 0, so 6. And then keep the subtraction sign. What's the distance from the origin is 2. It's a distance of 2. So now we have 6 subtract 2, which is 4. 
So this entire expression comes out to be 4. So that gives you an idea of how to evaluate expressions involving absolute value. All right, opposites. Opposite of a real number. So another very important concept about real numbers is talking about their opposites. So don't think that opposite always means negative. What if the number was negative? Then its opposite would be positive. So numbers of the same distance from the origin, or from zero, are called opposites if they're in opposite directions of the origin. So opposite directions, they're called opposites, but they must have the same distance from the origin. So example four, opposites. Find the opposite of the given real number. So positive eight. Your distance of eight on the number line away from zero, what would be its opposite from the opposite direction? Well, it would be negative eight. So opposite, negative eight. So number two, you have the number negative five. What's the opposite of negative five? Well, positive. So the opposite would be positive five. Number three, negative two thirds. The opposite would be positive two thirds. Because that's the same distance from the origin as negative two thirds. And then number four, negative 4.2 that opposite would be positive 4.2. Again, negative 4.2 is 4.2 units from the origin in the negative direction. 4.2 is 4.2 units from zero in the positive direction. So they are called opposites of one another. So each negative number is the opposite of a positive number, and each positive number is the opposite of a negative number. And one very important property about opposites is that opposites always have the same absolute value, which means exactly what the definition of opposite is. You're in the same distance from the origin, but you're in opposite directions on the number line. Okay, so let's finish up this first video talking about variables. So variables and intuitive look. So you may be very familiar about variables. Okay, variables just represents any real number. Okay, it's, it's a unknown real number. So we're going to be using variables quite often in this course. So the definition of a variable. A variable is a letter. It can be any letter. And it stands for a mathematical quantity. So much of what we do in algebra is about comparing quantities. You want to be able to use symbols to be able to compare how large is one real number to another real number. How do they compare in size or so what we do is we use comparison symbols. So comparison symbols fall into two major groups. You have the equality symbols, and you have the inequality symbols. So equality. Equality means they can be equal to one another. So A is equal to B. So these two numbers, to these two real numbers are equal. So A is equal to B. Or A is not equal to B. So it's an equal sign with a slash through it means not equal. So that's comparing A with B, whether they're the same or they're not the same. Now, inequalities, there's four. You have A, and then this symbol means less than. So A is less than B. So that means A is smaller than B. Or A is greater than B. So that means A is larger than B. So these first two, the less than and greater than, symbols do not include equality. Okay, so what that means is that A is less than B. It doesn't mean A equals B and less than. It just means it's strictly less than. And A greater than B means A is only bigger than B. They're not equal to each other and bigger, just bigger only. Now the third one is A greater than or equal to B. So if you have an underline underneath the greater symbol, it becomes greater than or equal to. So A is greater than B or equal to B. The last one is A is less than or equal to B. So A is less than B or equal to B. So these last two, the less than or equal to and greater than or equal
These do include the possibility of A equals B. Okay, you actually have it in the, in the word, actually what the symbol actually means. So you have A is greater than or equal to B. A is less than or equal to B. So these last two do include A equals B as a possibility. All four of these are called inequality symbols. So all four are called inequality symbols. So where do they come up in algebra? Well, you can use them again to compare how one real number compares to another in size. So for example, if you write 3 is less than x, that means 3 is smaller than x. So 3 is less than x, or you can think of it as x is greater than 3. So 3 is less than x, or x is greater than 3. They are saying the same exact thing, so they're both correct. So in addition to the four different comparison symbols we had for inequalities and two we had for equality, there are also four basic operations involving real numbers. You have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So addition, you have A plus B. The answer for adding A and B is called the sum. If you have subtraction, A subtract B, that's called difference, so the difference of A and B. So keep in mind, the order is important for subtraction. If it's the difference of A and B, A is first and B is second, so you're subtracting B from A. Multiplication can have several different notations. It can have a little tiny dot between A and B, so A times B. You might not have any operation indicated at all, which is implied to be multiplication. So parentheses A, parentheses B, there's no operation between A and B, so that's implied multiplication. A times B. A times B, or just nothing at all, and that's just A times B as well. So the answer when you multiply is called the product, so product of A and B. So one note I want to make is do not use X to mean multiplication. Now in grade school we would use X to represent multiplication, but you're not using variables quite often in grade school. This X can become very confusing if you're multiplying and also representing X as a variable. So we just don't use X for multiplication anymore. We just use a little tiny dot or parentheses. Okay, and the reason is in algebra, it is better to use a dot. And then the last operation is division. So you have A divided by B, or you can have a fraction represent division. So A divided by B, A divided by B, or A over B. And then you can also have the, the long division notation where the denominator is on the outside of the division and A is on the inside of the division bar. The answer when you divide is called the quotient of A and B. And with division, the order is important as well. So notice that if A is written first, that is the numerator, and if B is written second, that's the denominator when you're talking about quotients. So like I said, there are some key words that will tell you what the operation is in mathematics. So if you ever see the word sum, that means addition problem. If you ever see difference, that's subtraction. Product means multiplication, and quotient means division. We will also have what's called grouping symbols. So grouping symbols in mathematics can be either parentheses or square brackets most of the time. So open parentheses tells you that there's something going to be inside the parentheses. It could be an addition problem, subtraction problem, you could have exponent problem, you could have any type of operation inside the parentheses. The parentheses is just grouping those real numbers and those operations together. Same thing with square brackets. Square brackets just means you're grouping those operations and real numbers together. Very rarely though, you might see curly brackets or braces. So curly brackets around operations and real numbers also is grouping those together. Braces are also used when you're talking about set notation, which we're going to talk about in the next video. So let's finish up this first video by translating some mathematical expressions into words and vice versa. So let's say you have the expression 4 plus 1 equals 5. 5 is called the sum because it's the answer after you add 
1 and 4. So the sum of 4 and 1 is 5. Notice that is is replacing the equals. 8 subtract 1 is less than 10. That's one way you can write it or say it. You also can say the difference of 8 and 1 is less than 10. So notice that difference means subtraction. You have two parentheses, 3 plus 4. Outside the parentheses, you have equals 14. Notice that you're grouping 3 and 4 with parentheses. So the emphasis will be on the sum. You have the sum of 3 and 4, but then you're multiplying by 2 because there's no operation between the 2 and the parentheses. So it's twice the sum of 3 and 4 is 14. Okay, next one is 3 times x is greater than or equal to 15. 3 times x, another way of saying that is the product of 3 and x is greater than or equal to, because there's an underline underneath the inequality, so that's indicating the possibility of being equal to 15. So greater than or equal to 15. And then finally, y divided by 2 equals y subtract 2. So this means the quotient, because you're dividing, the quotient of y and 2 is equal to the difference, because you're subtracting on the right side of the equals, the difference of y and 2. So we're using sum, we've used difference, we've used product and quotient, we've used inequality symbols, and we've also used equals. So we kind of summarized all the key words that we just learned involving operations in math. So this is a good place to stop our first video. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about any of the problems in the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about formulas for area and perimeter. And we'll talk about set notation with sets and subsets.